Welcome to yet another one of our Friday frolics right here at Story and Song. This Friday, we're going to explore a favorite of mine, and that is Marjorie Kinnan Rollins' Cross Creek. Truly spectacular book. Uh, I'm going to tell you at some point about the illustrator for this volume, Edward Shenton, and his wife, and Gladys Tabor, that was a very unusual combination of friends that led to some artistic uh, experiences as well. But first and foremost, I want to tell you about Cross Creek. A number of years ago, I was the director of the museum, and coming back from a big conference in the Keys, I decided that, not being from Florida, but being familiar with some of the literature, that there's this cross creek somewhere. And it was sort of on my way back to uh, Amelia Island. And so a friend of mine and I decided to go back. And when I say go back, we went back a road, back down a lane, and it was really rather mystical and getting late in the evening. And it turned out it was not only late in the evening, but uh, the facility had been closed for the season and was very disappointed, but uh, got up, walked up on the porch, looked in the windows, and suddenly there appeared a docent who was in charge of the facility and wanted to know what we were doing. And I explained who I was and that I was up here. And she said, oh, you know, we are closed. But tell you what, why don't you just wander around? I'll, I'll give you about an hour or so, because it wasn't dark yet. And so we wandered around a bit. And I totally fell under the magic spell of that place. It was extraordinary. The books were in the shelves, the car was in the carport. Um, everything looked as if, if I just waited another five minutes, Marjorie Kinnan Rollins would be walking through the door. Now, having said all that, I'm going to share her words with what she experienced at Cross Creek. I'm going to read you the first chapter, which with a wonderful uh, drawing by, uh, or actually woodcut, by uh, Edward Shenton, this uh, creek flowing with uh, Spanish moss coming down and greeting the water. It's entitled, For This Is an Enchanted Land. The road goes west out of the village, past open pine woods and gallberry flats. An eagle's nest is a ragged cluster of sticks in a tall tree, and one of the eagles is usually black and silver against the sky. The other perches near the nest, hunched and proud, like a, a griffin. There's no magic here except the eagles. Yet the four miles to the creek are stirring like a, the bleak, portentous beginnings of a good tale. The road curves sharply. Vegetation thickens. And around the bend, masses into a dense hammock. The hammock breaks, is pushed back on either side of the road, and set down in its brooding heart is the orange grove. Any grove or any wood is a fine thing to see. But the magic here, strangely, is not apparent from the road. It is necessary to leave the impersonal highway to step inside the rusty gate and close it behind. By this, an act of faith is committed through which one accepts blindly the communion cup of beauty. One is now inside the grove, out of one world and in the mysterious heart of another. Enchantment lies in different things for each of us. For me, it is in this, to step out of the bright sunlight into the shade of orange trees, to walk under the arched canopy of their jade-like leaves, to see the long 
aisles of lichened tree trunks stretched ahead in a geometric rhythm, to feel the mystery of a seclusion that yet has shafts of light striking through it. This is the essence of an ancient and secret magic. It goes back, perhaps, to the fairy tales of childhood, uh, to Hansel and Gretel, to babes in the wood, to Alice in Wonderland, to all half-luminous places that please the imagination as a child. It may go back still farther to racial druid memories, to an atavistic sense of safety and delight in an open forest. And after long years of spiritual homelessness, of nostalgia, here is that mysterious loveliness of childhood again. Here is home. An old thread long tangled comes straight again. I think that the shabbiness of Creek is part of its endearing quality. I, for one, might admire but never truly love an affluent perfection. The Williamsburg Restoration, for instance, is fine and proud, but it is something only to be stared at. Old Williamsburg lived in a genteel poverty that was more elegant than the new shining governor's mansion, for its gentility came not from superimposed wealth, but from long years of gracious living. The restoration is a good thing, of course, and time will make all come right again. The creek shabbiness was never elegant and never will be. It is merely comfortable and weather-beaten, meeting time halfway. I'm sometimes tempted to put up a new fence across the house yard. I've always thought that a white picket fence must be a great comfort to a householder. I think of the pride I should take in seeing white paint gleaming from around the bend in the road. Then Snow, the, the grove man, becomes quietly tired of waiting for me to do something and comes driving the farm truck into the yard over the cattle gap with a load of fresh fatwood pine posts for the hammock. He asks, You aim just to use the old gate, don't you? I aim to use the old gate and say so. And snow goes ahead and replaces the rotten and sagging posts with new ones. He tightens the fence wire. Hog and cattle, four-inch mesh. And the effect is trim and imminently suitable. I tell myself that a white picket fence would interfere with the feeling one has inside the house of being part of the grove that a new fence would mean tearing out the coral honeysuckle vines that cling passionately to the old wire. But the real objection is that an elegant fence would bring to the creek a wanton orderliness that is out of place. When I came to the creek, I knew the old grove and farmhouse at once as home. There was some terror, such as one feels in the first recognition of human love, for the joining of person to place, as of person to person, is a commitment to shared sorrow, even as to shared joy. Ah, the farmhouse, what was all dinginess? It sat snugly then, as now, under tall orange trees. It had a simple grace of line, low, rambling, and one-storied. But it was cracked and gray for lack of paint. There was a tin roof <clears throat> that would have ruined a, a mansion, and the porch 
was in excrescence, scarcely wide enough for one to pass in front of the chairs. The yard was bare and sand spotted with sand spurs, with three lean duchess rose bushes left behind to starve like cats. Now inside the house, all the delight of the Florida sunlight vanished. The walls were painted a battleship gray, and the floors <laughs> a muddy ochre. The brick fireplaces, oh, they were walled over with tin and filled with years' rubbish. It was four years before the gray of the last room was decently covered with white, money for paint being scarce, and time so filled with other work that an hour with the brush was a stolen pleasure. And even now, the house shining inside and out, roofed with good gray hand-hewn cypress shingles, the long, wide screen veranda, an invitation to step either inside or out. The yard in lush green grass. There is still a look of weather-worn shabbiness. It is a constant reminder that wind and rain and harsh sun and the encroaching jungle are ready at any moment to take over. Now, I suppose that a millionaire, perhaps even just a New Englander, might stand off the elements and maintain a trim tidiness in a picket fence. But the rest of the creek would not know what to make of it and would be oh, most unhappy. The battle has not gone too well for all at the creek. One or two have gone ahead. Some hold precariously to the narrow ledge of existence, and others have slipped back and back until each day's subsistence has become a triumph. Their houses reflect their fortunes. Now mine lies the farthest east in the small settlement, to the west, are my neighbors, my friends. There have been enmities. Now, at the moment, we are living in unparalleled amiability, a state at Cross Creek that, like a sinner's hope of heaven, is never assured. But it makes a good moment in which to speak of other people. Now, I live within screaming distance of Tom Glisson and old boss Bryce. Now, this is literal. No ordinary sound carries from one place to the other. Oh, we, we hear faintly the barking of one another's dogs. We hear the far crowing at dawn of one another's roosters. Now, occasionally, when the wind is right, I hear the Bryce or Glisten cows lowing at milking time, night or morning. No voice carries, ever. A determined scream is audible. Now this I proved, oh, not in a time of fear, but a time of fury. I should be ashamed, but am not. A folk who would have been silent under the circumstances, there comes to mind only St. Francis, and I believe that he might have cast despairing eyes to heaven. Now, I can bear much physical discomfort and a great deal of actual pain, but now and then one achieves a combination of bodily annoyance that makes Job's boils seem a luxury. I shall be brief and explicit. I was entirely alone on the grove. The summer was one of two unbearable ones as to eat that I have known in my years here. 
Summer is our unproductive period for vegetables. I had been some time without them and was afflicted with an itching rash that I recognized too late as nutritional. Now, the widow Slater and I had been repairing fences together, for I gave her pasture for her mulch cars in return for milking of my, my own. Uh, we had plowed through long lines of poison ivy along the decrepit fence. Now, her long, black, flowing skirts had evidently protected her. I had worked stockingless and in reef voile. The poison ivy had erupted from hips to ankle, from fingertips to throat, overlaying the rash. Oh, soothing ointments and a prone position might have brought some ease. I was far from ointments and too busy to lie down. My cow broke loose from the pasture and came into the grove, tearing at the low-hanging orange boughs. I drove her out and penned her properly, and returning to the house, found myself in the middle of a patch of sand spurs, waist high. These barbed instruments of torture are all the proof one needs that there is a devil as well as a god. I was enmeshed with sand spurs. They stuck to my vol skirt and to petticoat, creeping up underneath and getting a firm hold with one or two barbs, leaving the others free to grate against my skin. Now on normal skin, they are like arrows. On a skin covered with rash and poison ivy, Oh, they were shafts of fire. I plucked at them as I went and came to the house. Oh, now there the dogs were waiting for me, shut on the back porch, since they had nothing but chaos to contribute in the matter of penning a cow. I did not think they had been there very long. Even for puppies, it did not seem too much to ask of them that they wait, like gentlemen, for half an hour. There were four, all told. There was my own puppy. There were two of his litter mates that a traveling owner had asked me to keep for him. And there was old Sport, whose huntsman master, my friend Fred, had left with me while he finished uh, on the, uh, and fished on the East Coast. I can only relate that time is relative and that what seemed like a short period to me was evidently a long, long time in the lines of three puppies. Old Sport had become excited at their incontinence and forgotten himself too. The porch was a shambles. Water, for cleaning, had to be brought from the outside pump, a bucket at a time. It took twenty buckets, as I remember, and dusk was on me when I finished. I went then, the porch well cleaned, wet and glistening in the fading light, to water my garden. There were a few carrots that I hoped to bring through the heat, a few zinnias, a half dozen desperate collard plants, poor things, but my own. I pulled away sand spurs abstractly as I carried out the watering pot. The mosquitoes descended upon me. One would think that exposed necks, arms, and face would suffice for the hungriest of insects. But a mosquito is Freudian, taking delight only in the hidden places. They wavered with their tunnels around the sand spurs and settled with hums of joy in all the unoccupied small spaces. <gasps> it was too much. I set down the watering spout 
and with no thought of help for my distress, for I was past helping, let out shriek after shriek of sheer indulgent frustration. As I say, St. Francis might have blessed the puppies in old sport and the mosquitoes with a kind word thrown in for the sand spurs. But I am not of the stuff of saints. I screamed. The screaming satisfied me. I finished the watering, went into the house, fed the dogs, made myself supper, and went to the veranda to meditate. As I sat, exhausted but content, two figures strolled cautiously up the road and paused in front of my gate. It was Tom Glisson and Old Boss. Old Boss said, uh, Everything all right? Why, why yes. <laughs> I said, yes, indeed. Tom said, Seemed to us like we heard somebody call for help. Now we just wondered, well, was everything all right? I hesitated. After all, there was nothing to be done, and at the moment it seemed all was too embarrassing to be told. I was singing, I said. Perhaps you heard me singing. Oh, they said, and turned, walked home again. So I say that I live within screaming distance of my nearest neighbors. Old uh, Moss's Grove joins up with mine. We share an east-west fence line and a double row of spite trees. The spite is not of our doing, but an inheritance from earlier owners of the adjoining groves. There was a day before the big freeze of 94-95, when oranges were truly golden apples, bringing in their, their rareness incredible sums. Suitable orange land was considered worth its weight in gold. So the two unfriendly neighbors planted their orange trees, each as close to the joint fence as possible to get all the good of the priceless soil. The result is the two lines of scrawny trees send out their roots furtively in search of sufficient nourishment. Among large trees, there are a few of whom two can live as cheaply as one. Old boss wandered down to Florida from Georgia as a boy, oh, nearly 60 years ago. He came down to die, he told me once, and wanted to die in the tropical sunshine. He is still a frail little man, but I think he drew sustenance from the sun and earth and the fruiting trees around him. He clerked in a country store in the village and became the owner. He yearned always for the creek, he said. At last he took over the neglected grove on an unpaid mortgage and moved out. It means to him precisely what it means to me. We sometimes sit together on his back porch and just look about us and say nothing. We seldom meet, but when we see each other down the road, we, we wave. And I know that the same warm feeling comes over the old man that comes to me. He has been father, arbiter, disciplinarian to all the Negroes who have ever lived or worked here. I challenged his authority on one occasion, uh, but now that is another story. His house is a Rococo two-story affair, tall and gangling like an antique Spinster. There is bamboo in the sandy yard, and hibiscus, and almanda, and pittosporum that is so old it is not a shrub, but a great tree covered 
in spring with minute flowers of a strange, exotic scent. The house is on the opposite side of the road from mine, just out of sight. And that's, this particular chapter continues with more of special people there, but I want to read you briefly something from the second chapter, which has a woodcut of a very handsome African-American woman, and she's backed with oranges. And it's called Taking Up the Slack. It is always bewildering to change one's complete way of life. I was fitted by temperament and by inheritance for farm and country living. Yet to take it up after some 30 years of urban life was not too easy. I had known my maternal grandfather's Michigan farm, but there I was both guest and child, and the only duties were to gather the eggs from the sweet-smelling hayloft. I had known my father's Maryland farm, but that farm was his love his escape from Washington governmental routine, and we lived there only in the too few summers. I had no duties at all there. Um, there was only delight, the flowering locust grove, the gentle cows in pasture, Rock Creek, which ran 10 miles away from its Washington Park at the foot of the Hill of Locusts, where my brother and I learned to swim and to fish for tiny, almost untakeable fishes. Long walks with my father through the woods, where he hoped some day to build a home. Jaunts with him behind old Dan in the carriage to the county seat of Rockville, uh, or to buy mules at Frederick. These things got in the blood, but were no preparation for running the farm oneself. When I bought the Florida orange grove with my inheritance uh, that represented my share of the Maryland farm, my father's sister, Madeline, wrote to me in lament. You have in you, she said. Oh, that fatal drop of pierce blood clamoring for change and adventure, and above all, for a farm. I never knew a Pierce who didn't secretly long for a farm. Mother had one. Uncle Pierman was ruined by one. There was your father's tragic experience. I had one once. I see no reason for denying so fundamental an urge, ruin or no. It's more important to live the life one wishes to live and to go down with it, if necessary, quite contentedly, than to live more profitably, but less happily. Yet to achieve content under Sometimes adverse circumstances requires first an adjustment within oneself. And this I had already made. And after that, a recognition that one is not unique in being obliged to toil and struggle and suffer. This is the simplest of all facts and the most difficult for the individual ego to accept. As I look back on those first difficult times at the creek, when it seemed as though the actual labor was more than I could bear, and the making of a living on the grove impossible, it was old black Martha who drew aside the curtain and led me in the company of all those who had loved the creek and been tormented by it. Martha, welcomed me with old-fashioned formality. She came walking toward me in the grove one bright, sunny December day. I turned to watch her magnificent carriage. It was erect, with long, free, graceful stride. It was impossible to tell her age. She walked like a very young woman, and walks so to this very day. 
She's getting on to seventy. Yet glimpsing her down the road, she might be a girl. She was dressed neatly in calico with a handkerchief bound round her head, bandana fashion. She was a rich, smooth brown. She came directly to me and inclined her head. She said, I come to pay my respects. I be's Martha. Martha Mickens. I said, How do you do, Martha? She said, I want to welcome you. Me and my man, oh Will, was the first hands on this place. Time the grove was planted. Me and Will worked here. It's home to me. Where do you live now? Other side of the creek. We's too old now to do steady work, but I just wants to tell you, any time you gets in a tight, us is here to do what we can. How long has it been since you worked here on the grove? <laughs> Sugar, she said. I got no way of telling the years. Years comes and the years goes. And it's been a long time. Was it the Herberts you worked for? Yes, um, they was mighty fine folk. They's been fine folk here since. And they's been trash. The sugar, the grove ain't trash. And the crick be trashified here and there, but it's the crick right on. I purely loves the creek, I said. I love it, too. Does you? Then you'll make out. I reckon you know. You got to be satisfied with the place to make out. And is you satisfied that it don't make too much difference? Does you make it out or, or not? We laugh together. She said, heap of folks has lived here. Ain't nobody lived here since the Herberts, but had to scratch and scramble. Ones loved it, stayed till death, or sick take them away. Ones ain't loved it, has moved on like the wind moves, I said. Grove hasn't always made a living then. <laughs> Pens on what you calls a living. To get your grease and grits in the place you enjoys getting them. Now ain't that making a living? Hmm. Yes. And now I've got to tell you. Next Friday, I'm going to share with you Marjorie Kinnan Rollins' connection of Cross Creek. To Fernandina. You don't believe it's there? Well, <laughs> you're just going to have to tune in next Friday and get the rest of the story. Till then, you have the most wonderful of weekends.